Um, one of the great joys of working in the Australian environment is managing the respective um, obligations of the federal and state governments and one of the success stories is the Great Barrier Reef Field Operations Arrangements and we have a double headed presentation here, um, Richard Quincy and John Hicks, uh, Richard from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and John from the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service and I'm going to let you two gentlemen work out who's who and when to win. Uh, good morning, uh, my name's Richard Quincy and uh, John Hicks was uh, just up here before and will be my co-presenter. I'd just like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners on land whose land we meet today and by doing that their elders past and present including all of the Aura Nation. Uh, the Joint Field Management Program, and somehow we seem to be at the end of the presentation at present. Uh, the the uh, Joint Field Management Program is actually a, a joint partnership between the Commonwealth and Queensland governments that has endured for 30 years uh, since the creation of the Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park. Uh, and that in itself is, is, is a good thing. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about resilience, risk and return on investment innovations from our field management program. Uh, one of the key problems that most people have in protected area management globally is matching a finite set of resources to the priorities to achieve the best environmental outcomes. Uh, we're going to use three examples to talk to you about that today. The first is the planning of our surveillance. Um, the, the message that we have for the Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park and World Heritage Area in surveillance is that it's big. Uh, it's multiple use and it has uh, uh, 30, about 33% of no-take areas. So the green areas on the map are the no-take areas. But as you can see, many of the other places are, uh, are open to uh, fishing and other activities of extraction. Uh, and, and they're very close together, so, so our, our compliance model needs to be uh, able to deal with that. We've got many offences in, in the marine park that happen, and this is our, our, our trend graph. Now, the thing about this as well is that not all offences are equal. There are a smaller set that are very high impact, uh, but this graph in the 1057 last year shows that, that about half of them were recreational based and about another third are, are fairly minor tourism related, even administrative related, relating to our revenue generation. But there's a batch at the top of that pyramid that are the red dots, which are the more environmentally significant offences. Um, our approach is to have a very sound basis to compliance uh, management planning that is risk based and tries to weed out uh, what are those things that we need to concentrate on more specifically. In taking into account that approach, we use uh, a lot of information risk assessment process. We look at weather patterns, seasonal fisheries trends, uh, traditional owner knowledge in terms of some of the, the, the poaching of uh, species. Um, we also look at profiling at a number of different geographical scales. Uh, and also at activity levels. So we range right from looking at a whole commercial fishing industry down to profiling individuals uh, in that. The, this is um, a very busy slide, but essentially it's a, one of the tools of the outputs of our risk planning process that, that says that, that the red, red areas are the high target areas for us by individual commercial fisheries demonstrated here and by sectors along the coast. The, the message from this one is that our process outputs a lot of tools for us to use in conjunction with our, our partner agencies. So in the World Heritage Area, there, there are many providers or deliverers of compliance. It is not just a single field management program that delivers it. And our process is to look at working with all of these partners who in their own right have different roles. Some are fisheries, some are immigration, some are marine park focused. Our, our approach is to coordinate that partnership and deliver products and discussion and training as needed to focus people on the marine park aspects while they go about their normal business. And, and that's part of our innovative approach that has really helped us coordinate a compliance program in the Great Barrier Reef. And I'll now pass over to John Hicks to, to go on with the other two examples.
Thanks, Richard. Good morning, everyone. The uh, second example is our strategic approach that we use to prioritising management actions for Great Barrier Reef Islands. We use the uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service Park Category System for this. There are 33 aggregations of Great Barrier Reef Island National Parks and uh, in, in this uh, map we've colour coded those, those areas. For each of the categories there's a ranking of uh, nature conservation value from outstanding to moderate and in order to um, make this a, a simple and effective tool, we uh, draw a risk matrix where um, uh, threats are ranked from very high to low. And our priority goes to this area, this quadrant of the matrix. So the examples, uh, the intersection of outstanding conservation values and very high threat naturally gets the highest management priority. So I'm going to uh, go on and talk about two specific examples based on this uh, risk assessment. And those examples relate to down here in the Capricornia case at the southern end of the World Heritage Area. And the other one is for Rain Island at the northern end of the World Heritage Area. Starting with Capricornia Caves, many of the islands in the Capricornia Caves National Park feature a Pisonia forest. Uh, between 1994 and 2000 at Tryon Island National Park, there were many cycles of Pisonia forest defoliation caused by recurring scale insect infestations. And this resulted in the loss of the forest canopy. The scale outbreaks are promoted by an introduced ant that farms the scale for their honeydew and protects them from their primary native predator, ladybirds. So an introduced uh, exotic ant uh, triggered this cycle of defoliation. You can sit, oh, sorry. You can see here the, um, uh, the transition from forested to nearly complete canopy loss. In 2006, at a nearby island, Wilson Island, field management staff detected the start of a scale insect outbreak in the island's Pisonia forest. The uh, control actions were initiated because we'd been through uh, this experience um, uh, with Trine and we were trying to get onto a preventative pathway. So control actions comprised uh, assessing the extent of the scale outbreak and the ant infestation. There was whole island baiting for the introduced uh, ant pest. Uh, this was with a bait that was specific to that introduced ant, uh, not native ants. And following the eradication of the introduced ants, 10,000 cultured ladybird predators were released. The result was the scale uh, outbreak was prevented and the Bisonia forest was saved. Now these actions also benefited the high-end ecotourism uh, resort on the island which is set amongst the Pisonia forest. Back to Tryon Island. Uh, National Park um, um, staff working with volunteers have instigated a recovery program there and the forest has been restored. Thousands of cuttings from healthy Pisonia trees on an adjacent National Park were planted out on Tryon Island. The result has been very successful after eight years. <coughs> the Pisonia forest has been restored. There's a high canopy, five metre high trees, and they are now shading out the weeds 
that had been the previous phase shifted habitat on Trine Island. And those trees are now providing nesting habitat for a seabird such as black noddies and wedge tailed shearwaters. Our final example is Rain Island. Um, it's the jewel in the crown of the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. It's a national park and the largest remaining green turtle rookery in the world, with approximately 90% of the northern Great Barrier Reef uh, turtle population. The problem statement for Rain Island is that the nesting habitat has changed since 1975 when monitoring began. Beach profiling changes mean that today 70% of the uh, uh, potential nesting area is non-viable due to tidal flooding of nests. In peak seasons, up to 2,000 uh, adult females uh, can die from cliff falls or entrapment in beach rock crevices and through exhaustion and dehydration following disorientation in the nesting area. Hatchling production is running at 15% instead of the expected 80 to 90%. The solutions being trialled here uh, guided by a climate change adaptation plan. Um, the options have been uh, considered, run through a, a risk matrix, and the, the, um, those that options, we've started with those options that present low risk reversible actions that offer potentially high con uh, conservation returns on investment. So some of the actions already being uh, trialled include installing, I keep it, sorry, keep hitting the wrong button, installing 800 metres of fencing, uh, and this prevents uh, mature adult females from falling over cliffs, and over time that will save thousands of females using power carriers when field staff are on site to return disoriented turtles to the sea before they're killed by overheating and filling cavities in the beach rock to uh, prevent entrapment. But the, um, the biggest intervention being considered is improving the uh, nesting area by reprofiling the beach. By adding sand, uh, we can elevate the nest above the egg death zone, the area that's being um, that we're nests are flooded by tidal inundation. Beach profiling trials were undertaken last year on an area of beach, small area of beach, about 50 by 80 metres. And the results of that um, were that that area wasn't sufficient or robust enough to uh, withstand the digging of a large number of uh, turtles. So a larger trial um, um, will be undertaken to, to follow this up. The question is, uh, can Rain Island survive the 21st century? And the short and overly simplified answer is yes. And the traditional thinking about business as usual is beginning to change as impacts and population declines are better understood. This project has demonstrated that innovation can deliver practical adaptive actions and, and support a resilient future for Rain Island sea turtles. So to summarise, we've used three examples, planning of surveillance, prioritising management actions for Great Barrier Reef Islands and Rain Island turtle nesting recovery. These examples illustrate how iterative risk-based planning uh, of field management actions is being used to deliver the best feasible resilience and conservation outcomes from the available resources. Thank you.